than just interoperability. It's about setting minimum levels of protection and safety. They rely on test methods. Test methods, of course, are important because you want manufacturer A that's making a claim and saying they got a certain performance level to be able to be comparable to manufacturer B that's making a similar or different claim. So the standardization of test methods is, is obviously important. There's ways that you can rank products, too. We don't see that much in this industry, but by having classifications as things might be better, uh, moderate, or poor, you can discriminate products in some fashions. But what we rely on in the fire service are minimum performance specifications. And these, of course, are requirements that take in different types of design and performance criteria, performance criteria being based on test methodologies and set minimum requirements. NFPA standards and the other standards that you rely on the fire service are minimum requirements. They in themselves are generally not acceptable for your level. You have to go beyond the standards. When it's all said and done, you still need to also have standards that govern practices that affect how you select, use, and care for protective clothing. And so these types of things are important. So the ideal process that you have starts off with which you'll be hearing a lot today, is a hazard and risk assessment. Now this ideal process says that you go out and you figure out what is it that I need to protect against. And so you build your criteria in the second step around that. If you need to have certain levels of insulation, what those insulation are, how you're going to measure it, what levels are going to be minimally acceptable. The third part of the process is to demonstrate that you do comply with those requirements, a conformity assessment. But what we call it is certification. The certification is the process by which you, you demonstrate, you prove that your product meets it. And then lastly, as I spoke about practices, it's important to have ways that once you have a product and it's standardized and it meets, it's shown to meet that standard, that there's ways that the fire service and end users can then be told and instructed on how to select, use, and to maintain those products. Well, one of the areas I want to talk about that's become a, a significant issue to me of late is test method development. Um, all the requirements, the vast majority of the requirements that you have in standards are based on test methods because those essentially allow you to demonstrate how a product performs. Now, not all methods are good. In fact, we have in our standards a number of methods which have been 
best efforts have been made to put those methods forward, but they're not necessarily doing what they're supposed to do, or they don't make the assessment quite the right way, or there's some other issue with them. But a good test method is one that assesses directly the property of interest. And when I say that, it seems fortuitous that you know, you're going to measure something, I'm going to measure insulation, well, surely I'm going to be measuring the right thing, but it's not always the case that you're actually measuring what you think you are. The other part of a good test method is it has to be repeatable. Between laboratories, you have lab A come out with one result and lab B come out with a different result on the same product using the same procedures, you get a problem. The problem is because you're setting minimum criteria. Lab A may pass the product, lab B may fail it. And then where does that leave the end user in understanding whether their client, their product is any good or not? But the last and most important attribute of a good test method is one that discriminates the performance of the product consistent with what's seen in the field. That means that if you have a test that measures some property and there's a way that that test, when you apply it to a variety of products, can rank products, when you go out to the field and you, and you look at how those same products are performing in the field, the test should rank things similarly. Otherwise, it's not a good test. Now, another important thing about this slide is you'll see that here we have a thermal man test. This is a test that's applied to full garments. We do not have that in any of our standards. It's a, it's a test that would look at the performance of an entire ensemble, or at least a garment system, to a flash fire. But most of the tests we do are on, on parts and pieces, at least for garments. For hoods and for boots and, and gloves and footwear, usually those items are tested whole, or at least not, don't have as many components. As you talk about garments, garments are all tested in parts and pieces. Well, our standards for this industry come from the National Fire Protection Association. And it's a good process. In fact, it's an, it's an outstanding process by which standards are formed. And just to give you a little bit of sense of how it works, is there are committees that are established that write the standards, like NFPA 1971 on structural firefighting and proximity firefighting protective clothing and equipment. Now, these committees have fixed sizes. There can only be so many members, but the committees meetings themselves are open and all parts of the process are open. In fact, the NFPA stipulates that there is a balance between the various interests. Uh, manufacturers can only have one third of the membership. Uh, any interest group, whether it be uh, research and testing or users, none of those groups can have any more than one third. Unfortunately, the reality of the standards process is that end user participation isn't where we would like to have it. Uh, we have on paper memberships that are balanced, but when it comes to fire service participants in the process at meetings, usually it's a little less limited than that because of the resource demands that you have and able, being able to participate. So I encourage you that when you have issues to bring them forward to your leadership, Rich Duffy or other individuals that can bring that forward to because the IFF, for example, has representatives on these, um, most of these committees. The focus of NFPA is to come up with these minimum performance standards. And these standards really include a vast variety. If anyone that's looked at them, they're, they're 200 pages long, they're, they're a lot of detail, they're not expected to be any kind of light bedtime reading. But certainly they're prescriptive and they, they do cover a large degree of detail re required for these products are probably the most rigorous standards in the world for any kind of personal protective equipment. One of the nice things about NFPA is that the standards go through a revision every five years at least or somewhere on that order. And that's of course to account for emerging technologies, changes in testing methods, and just simply the needs of the fire service. But the most important part of NFPA, and the one again I want you to value and take back with you, is the fact that you have the ability to provide input different stages of the process, either through proposals, when the start of the revision occurs, or new documents being put together, or through comments. And again, if you don't know how to do that, you can bring that to your leadership, to the NFPA. If there's issues that you have, those can be brought forward. Well, another key aspect of NFPA standards is the fact that they employ third-party independent certification. And probably, again, the most rigorous certification requirements of any products anywhere. The organization itself that conducts the certification has to be accredited, it has to go through a number of different steps of meeting a variety of different standards itself, even to offer an, a certification of a product. 
But this is important because obviously when you look at a label of the product and you see that it conforms to the standard, there's a mark of the certification organization. I have two of the organizations shown here, the Safety Equipment Institute and Underwriters Laboratories, that you have some understanding and guarantee essentially that that product has met the standard. Now the certification process is quite rigorous. It includes not only the testing the product and standards so that it meets all their criteria and the examination for design criteria, but there's quality assurance because let's face it, if you're testing just a couple limited products, how is that representative of everything that comes off the production line? The only way that you can try to guarantee that is by having every product made exactly the same way so that when an auditor comes in and pulls a product off the production line, it's going to test just the same as the product that was initially tested. And other aspects of retesting uh, annually, the requirement for safety alerts, product recalls, these are all part of the certification process. Now, it's rigorous, but it's not perfect. And certainly, uh, the certification organizations endeavor to provide the highest level of quality, as do the manufacturers that participate in this process. But it is, it is an important part to providing higher levels of health and safety. Well, what has the IFF done for you in terms of providing uh, support in this process? The IFF has probably been the leading, most leading organization in standards development for fire service personal protective equipment. It started out with an or a project called Project Fire, so it essentially defined the modern turnout clothing requirements. There's requirements for the design, there's the mandate of a moisture barrier, there's components of various parts of the ensemble, and most importantly, it, it came up with a new way of measuring thermal insulation through a process or test called thermal protective performance. Now this test, which is pictured in this bottom photograph, shows a very detailed test that replicates a flash over type of condition and also takes the results to measure, being measured in terms of a predicted second degree burn injury. Now what's significant about this is the fact that prior to the introduction of the TPP test, the way thermal insulation was measured and guaranteed was by just measuring the thickness of the, the composite, which sounds ridiculous now, but that was the law of the land before 1986 when the TPP test was first introduced. So um, there are other tests that became part of the, that part of the standard. Uh, one of the tests I think bears a little bit of explanation is a test known as the oven test, or it's actually heat resistance. In this, in this test, you have an oven, and that oven is a special oven that controls the exposure of a material that's placed inside the oven. In this case, we have a material. It also could be a glove, a helmet, uh, footwear, and that's exposed to a condition, five minutes at 500 degrees. Now, you may question, that's not a condition I would expect to survive, so why are you picking this condition and exposing the material in this fashion? That's because that work done early by the IFF demonstrated that those conditions resulted in taking out materials that they found to be problematic in the fire service, like polyester and nylon and some other things that would easily melt and exacerbate the burn injuries of individuals if things really got out of hand. Just as a, 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 a side to that, just to show how tests can really deviate from what you expect for realistic expectations. That is, Sometimes tests don't seem to mimic the environment that they're intended to replicate. There's a, you have a station work uniform shirt here. They rely on the oven test to categorize clothing as acceptable or not. There's clothing that is flame resistant, that's an option. But regular turnout clothing should not contribute to the hazards of the wear. And consequently, they have the oven test, but it wasn't good enough to take out some of the blends of polyester with cotton, and so they had to come up with a test where using this very same oven, material is placed between plates, it's folded, and put in the oven for a period of six plus hours at a somewhat higher temperature just to be able to get the discrimination to knock out those polyester plants. Which is, again is pretty bizarre because you think about a six hour exposure, I mean it doesn't even seem to make sense. But it demonstrates to you that a test doesn't always look like the environment in which it's trying to replicate. Which brings me to thermal conditions. This is a classic chart that shows the different types of fire ground conditions. Now remember, a fire ground environment, as you know fully well, is dynamic. There's ever-changing conditions. But what this does is establish some framework for expectations for clothing performance. I mentioned, for example, that the oven test, that oven test is uh, 
right about there in terms of condition. You have air temperature and you have levels of thermal radiation here. Now the TPP test is on a flash flow. This is an emergency condition. So what's important about these three boxes, emergency, ordinary, and routine, is the expectation for how much protection the clothing is intended to prov provide. In the emergency condition, we're talking about tens of seconds. For ordinary exposure conditions, where you have pretty much a range of about 140 degrees Fahrenheit to 571 degrees Fahrenheit, the expectation is minutes. When you get down to the routine level, then you're talking about tens of minutes. So the expectation performance is important with the different fire ground conditions. Well, what kinds of scenarios exist for how individuals are burned and how do standards address that? We talked about the TPP test as being a test for demonstrating the insulation. And here we have a clothing set that was exposed to a flash fire condition. And that, and fortunately, was overwhelmed in this case where an individual was burned. And the burns correspond pretty much where the damage are. There are a lot of circumstances where burn injury occurs and there's no damage to the clothing. And th this is important because there are a lot of different factors that affect how burn injuries occur. And whenever a committee, a standards committee, tries to develop a standard, they can only take a snapshot. It's one, they pick one single condition in order to make that measurement. But there's really an infinite number. You get different conditions of moisture, the condition of clothing, so on and so forth. They try to take that into account, but the fact is they can't. Now, protective clothing up through the 2000 edition was all predicated on just TPP testing as setting the insulation levels. They then earlier introduced a test called conductive and compressive heat resistance, which looked at the insulation of the knees and the shoulder areas of the garments. And that helped departments be able to justify uh, insulation areas and parts of the garments where they expected to have either more burn injury or more severe effects. More recently, they've uh, put together a stored energy test which covers the phenomenon of where an individual goes into a fire, their clothing is heated, it absorbs that heat, and then they either bend their elbow, they, they press against something, there's some kind of contact between the heat stored in that garment and then the, the body or skin, and that energy transfers through, causing a burn injury. Well, the committee, in putting together, in my opinion, is really just done a cursory way of doing. They've got a method in right now to deal with stored energy, but I don't think they did the full study to understand the extent of stored energy burns and how it went. Because as it is right now, it's going to affect just the sleeves of a garment, and that's it on a coat. And while that may be a step forward, there's still a lot of field work that needs to be understood to be able to set criteria that are more meaningful. You have insulation, but and, the, and if you, the theory would be if you just wanted to protect firefighters build, better, you would simply just build that insulation thicker and thicker. Well, obviously that comes as a trade-off. The trade-off is, of course, the increased stress on a firefighter. The IFF led a study back in 1998 that we worked with them on, called, we call the Indianapolis Field Study. It was a study that was undertaken to look at the stress impact of clothing on firefighters. And it was done in a fashion where there was a test that was being promoted at the time, known as total heat loss. And that test, we wanted to see if that test could predict. And this is, where, this is a case of where the work was done correctly. I like to say that in every case that we put test methods and requirements in the standard, there's been a lot of science that goes behind it and a lot of deliberation and decisions. Unfortunately, that's not the case. In this case, though, it was. And that was a study that the IFF had led that demonstrated that a particular test would be able to predict the stress on a firefighter. I mean, these firefighters went through controlled exercises of both engine and ladder company simulations to measure metabolic uh, heat rays through core temperature and skin temperature. Uh, there was a number of other measurements that made, and at the end of the day, they were able to show that systems with different THS, THL values could provide better protection. Now, this is a, an old slide because most of these products no longer comply, but this shows a number of composites that are represented in this, these, by these colored uh, dots. You have total heat loss across one axis and then TPP or thermal insulation across the other. And so you're looking at breathability versus protection. And you can see that you have a range of composite performance. Well, the first time that NFPA set the standard, they set it at 130, mistake. They said it was a mistake, it was a mistake, but they did it for accommodation purposes of 
existing technology. The IFF study clearly showed that a limit of 205 was the better limit, but the committee took a more conservative approach, which is represented by this line here. So you can see that there was a number of composites that were originally compliant, and this was to the 2000 edition, and then the 2007 edition, they, they went to the actual 205, and this is where they are now. So obviously what you're trying to do is drive, maximize both thermal protective performance and total heat loss. And as Tom and Carl will tell you later on, your hazard and risk assessment is going to dictate where you want to be on that continuum and where that trade-off will occur. The other thing that the IFF has done, it's been a very, uh, very strong advocate for introducing barrier technology. And barrier technology has been an important part of it. It started through Project FIRES, it's uh, come to some culmination in Project HEROES, an initiative by the International Association of Firefighters. And it deals with a lot of different things. The hazards, of course, the firefighters face are hot water and bloodborne pathogens and liquid chemicals. And Project HEROES is also chemical and biological war for agents, but the issue is that firefighters succumb to a variety of different hazards. Uh, they can uh, either infection-based or, or disease-based or some sort of toxicity-based, and these hazards are growing in fire service responses. And so having good barriers in the materials and the design itself. And what Project Heroes did is, was to really to focus on systems testing and to focus on interfaces between different parts of the ensemble. And with the concerns about cancer presumption laws and whatnot, this is the type of direction it needs to go. But then again, remember, there's this balance between breathability and comfort and thermal stress on the individual. So it's all a tough balancing act. Now, there are concerns, you know, that, as I point out, that standards are put together, and, I, and you, as the fire service, have to rely on them. But it's not always the case that the tests work exactly the way that we want them to. I mean, we try to endeavor to put together tests that provide meaningful information, set the right requirements, and not be over-restricted, and it's a very tough job to do. There are sometimes tests that look right that don't work right. Um, here we have an instance where an individual fighting a vehicle fire was wearing a glove and received burns on their back of their hand. This is an investigation carried out for the IFF. And as part of this investigation, it was determined that the back of the hand insulation was not sufficient. Well, there are some test tools out there that will measure thermal insulation in the back of the hand. In fact, there's one in the standard right now, but it's not a radiant heat exposure. It's a conductive exposure. Well, there's some neat tools out there that are coming out that look like they would do the job, but when, uh, but when they're actually applied, they don't show the difference. They don't pre predict the problem. In this city, FDNY had a glove problem. They had to pull all the gloves out of service because a product was found to be non-compliant. The test that showed that they're non-compliant, they had uh, over a dozen burns now, back of the hand burns, was not the test where the environment was occurring. But yet, there's been promotion of new tests that say, well, we need to have this new test to provide better glove technology. The test, providing a test alone is not going to improve the products. What it's going to provide they will understand the products is having tests that reliably predict the types of things that firefighters are seeing. The other issue I wanted to point out with standards real quick is sometimes you get a lot of zeal and I think go a little further forward than we need to. Rich Diffie at a re recent presentation told the story about the drag rescue device. Now it's a mandatory part of all protective coats from the 2007 edition onward. And it's a device, it's a life-saving device, and there can be a lot of debate about this, but it's mandated. There's no other options for departments to follow. And since it was added in 2007, it's estimated that there's been about a million coats in production. DRD costs about $150 or so to actually put into a, a garment. So you look at $150 million that the fire service has spent, and to date, we don't know of a single deployment. That's a lot of money. But also, it's a big debatable area. I mean, it's, it's a safety device. And so I just throw that out, out to you for your consideration. There are a lot of departments that say, hey, you know, to be able to, to operate that under the conditions we have is going to be really tough. It, is, it works for some departments to swear by it. So this is the kind of feedback that we need from your membership. There's always issues with standards. Uh, we have some that come up all the time. The classic is goggles versus face shields uh, on helmets. 
And, and then we even get issues about what type of face shield might be acceptable. And it's a huge debate. And inevitably what happens is it happened this time in the revision process, they're going to allow everything to be uh, part of the standard. But there's always proponents in one direction or the other. Other issues that come into play within standards like gear retirement, you know, the 10-year rule, it's been uh, debated by a lot of organizations about whether that's something they can comply with. Uh, obviously, there's some good basis for that because gear that's old and needs to be retired and out of date in terms of the technology for testing and whatnot probably should be looked at. But again, it's a highly debated issue that the committee has to deal with all the time. We also run into conflicts within standards. Um, we have a new standard for, NF for uh, thermal imaging cameras, but no certified products. Why is that? Because there's a test method in the standard which no one can meet. In fact, the study was done by the NFPA Research Foundation that showed that not only is the test flawed, it doesn't produce the results even close to what the expectations were of the end users. So we make mistakes. And unfortunately, in this case, that means there's no certified products in the marketplace. So there has to be a lot of due diligence in this process. I mean, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. We also have cases, uh, the IFF's been heavily involved in looking at new pressure vessels for SCBA. In fact, there was an industry briefing on Monday, which we provided, and that shows that the potential benefits, and they're, they're still, they're debatable, but the NFPA 1981 standard that covers SCBA would allow that device to be certified if they even wanted to or, or chose to. So standards can also be restrictive. They can be design restrictive in the way the requirements are set. Now I'm showing you a test, and you have to kind of turn sideways. This is a boot that's being evaluated for flame resistance. I'm particularly critical of this test because this is the extent of the test as it's been put in the standard. Essentially, the committee, or portions of the committee, decided to come up with a new flame test for boots. No one was having problems with, no one was having any problems with boots catching on fire or, or heat transfer through the sole of the boot, but yet those test methods were changed. And, and I look at a test like I say, okay, where's your calibration? You know, how are you controlling the exposure? How are you, you know, we're talking about reliability and precision and meaningful data and everything like that. I mean, this looks like a weenie roast. And so it's, it's you know, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed that this is going into the stand. This is going in in 1971 as it stands right now. And, and I think we as a committee owe you better than a test like this that comes up in you know, a Rube Goldberg type method. So, you know, I, you know, the message, the perspective that I want to leave you with is, is that standards affect your choices. Standards are challenges for manufacturers. I've been on committees where we said that the, the end users got together and the first service said, hey, we want this. And the manufacturer said, no, we can't do it. And we demanded it and we got it because we asked for it. You know, but you have to have some practical basis for it. You can't have a standards restrict new technology. The, the statement that the creation of standards has to be based on science. You have to have good science that goes into test methods, but you also have to balance that with practical reality. Uh, there's too many times where they don't necessarily come together. And that's why, as our last point, we'd like to tell you that what we're looking for and we'll, we'll help you with this. We're, we're asking the fire service to provide a greater voice in the standards process. If there's things you don't like, you things you want to change, you can go to Rich Duffy and come to me. I'll write the proposal, the comment for you. I don't care if I agree with it or not. I'll just put it forward because we want that input to the process. So I want to thank you for your attention today. And what we're going to do with our format is we're going to go straight to the next presentation. At the end, we'll have comments and questions. So I'm going to bring Carl up here and um, get his uh, presentation going. And there we go, Carl. I'll move right into it. Thank you.
him to take the science associated with executive ensembles and help you put that into a practical application. The slides that I have in my presentation are part of a two and a half day course that I teach to organizations, either uh, as a class in a central location or I can come to your location and do it myself. I'll make my PowerPoint presentation available to you. So after this presentation or throughout the next couple of days, if you'd like to have a copy of this, please uh, stop me uh, or email me. I'll be happy to share it with you. Getting going, the title of my presentation is Using a Program. The program approach to increase safety and health of members wearing personal protective ensembles. I always like to start at this slide right here. The reason I do this is, is that historically, as I run across organizations and as members, is the members do not always regard their personal protective ensemble as life support equipment. They see it as a helmet or they see it as a jacket. And historically, they know it does work for them, but they do not understand the full implications of what it's really trying to do. So I'll start with this. I try to change your attitude to realize that it is not the same as it was a generation ago. It is not as it was when I was a firefighter. It works entirely different. And when the ensemble is married up to the SCBA, it starts to form an envelope with the firefighter and it becomes life support equipment. Once I try to make that attitude change, and things come different, you'll see when momentarily. The mission, the ensemble has a mission now. <coughs> it's to protect the firefighter from safety hazards and health risks associated with firefighting. And NFB 1971 provides you that criteria. Now, what I wanted to drive in this slide right here is that once an ensemble is on, it's an envelope of protection that's being formed here. The firefighter is now being cocooned in this ensemble and is going to provide that protection. Now, the ensemble is broken down into elements. I use the word ensemble and elements because they are proper nouns. They are defined by NFPA. So as I speak, I can't use that. However, you'll still hear words like ensemble gear, turnout gear, and I'm sure there are other acronyms that mean the same thing. But when we look at an ensemble, what you see on this slide right here are all of the elements that comprise that ensemble. What we've done now is we've taken it from the top picture what we now have on the bottom picture, not although there are a lot of similarities, uh, but they do <coughs> perform entirely differently. The picture on the top is from my generation. I remember it very well. It extended up into the mid 80s. In fact, the organization that I worked for at that point in time, even though we had SCPAs available to us, we actually had written SOPs in place. You would not wear the SOP or the SCPA until your company officer does, because the next fire might be bigger. So we trained without the SCBA. The program is a planned approach. I stress that. The program is a planned and structured approach to PPE and governs many facets of the personal protective ensemble. This is a title slide. I put that here. I'm working right now under contract with the U.S. Air Force. We are writing a program for the Pacific Air Command and its nine organizations. And what drove us this point is the PACAP command has been spending a considerable amount of money on training its members and retraining its members. And what was failing was this. The members were very fluid. They're moving in and out of these organizations. And once that happens, they have lost the benefit of that training. And because the program was not documented, they lost the consistency and continuity that they were supposed to have with that. So now we're backing up, we're reapproaching it, and we're putting in place a documented system. And this would be the very first page in that book. In a moment, you're going to hear from Chief Foley from Cal Fire. He's going to talk about his program, and this is going to come back into play here. Now, your program might be different. It's strictly structural firefighting. Of course, this would be edited to take out the word proximity. But this is the leading page for the PACAPS documented program for the selection care and maintenance. When you're looking at the program, these are some of the attributes that go into the program. It needs to be researched, planned, and documented. These first three aspects for PACAP have taken me almost four months to write and to get into position. Then we will train it as I go out to each organization. I will be there to assist them to implement it. So once it's implemented and is going on their own, they will need to manage it. And by managing it, this program will only require updates. As people move in and out, the standards change, 
there could be any number of factors that will require this living, moving document to be updated as time goes on. As we look at the program, the program should provide for these parts. Now, in looking at this, the selection, the use, and the maintenance are the three core components that are absolutely mission critical. I like to use the administrative part to begin to lay the groundwork of the program to define roles and responsibilities, for example, standards, and we're going to get into that momentarily. And attachments. I like to put explanatory material into the documents. When I'm working with organizations, one of the things I strive for an organization is to encourage them to want to put this together. I sell them on the features and benefits of having a program rather than sitting there hitting them over the head with, you have to, you shall, and you need to. Although that's true, <coughs> NFPA and OSHA both will come together. Both of these standards and regulations will require a program of sorts. But what I really want to do is to sell the programs to the organization. If they come as a willing player, and their members come as a willing player, we have a working program versus one where we drag everybody kicking and screaming. So in the attachments, what I tend to do there is provide material to all members of the organization is why are we doing what we're doing and with them, which is what's in it for me. And breaking it down further, and drilling down deeper, we get into selection. And, and what are we looking at in selection? What we're looking for here is to provide the member of the organization with an ensemble that is suitable and appropriate. It's going to work for your applications. In addition to suitable and appropriate, we also have a term called proper type, and they go even deeper, proper type and amount. Amount, you may have to look at two sets of ensembles, especially when you're factoring care and maintenance. So you're looking at this, suitable and appropriate, proper type and amount will come into play. We then get into the use. The second core component of a program, use. What we're trying to do here is provide the member with the knowledge and skills to understand their ensemble. They understand how to work in it. More importantly, they understand how to survive in it. They recognize early enough signs of impending equipment failure. The ensemble is starting to, to quit on them. It doesn't mean the ensemble is going to fall off onto the floor, but what it means is the ensemble is becoming overwhelmed and now we're seeing the system no longer protect the user. What we have seen in these cases right here is the firefighter has failed to recognize that in time, or the firefighter has may have recognized it, but because no one else is sounding the alarm, they were hesitant to sound the alarm for fear of being looked at as weaker, or the weak link in the chain, which is incorrect. We also want to provide the member with the working knowledge of the program. Everybody has to know their role and responsibility. The way the program was intended to be written, every member of the organization from the fire chief all the way down to the firefighter is going to have some role and some responsibility in the program. I wish I had more time to go into more detail on that, but that suffice to say everybody's going to play. And the only way it's going to work is everybody knows how to play with the program. In maintenance, the goal of the maintenance program is to provide an ensemble to the member that is clean, sanitary, and safe. OSHA calls it safe and usable, but all of them are going to come together. We're going to take an ensemble that we know is going to become soiled, we know it's going to become contaminated at some point in time, and take that ensemble and put it back into a safe and usable condition again. So maintenance has come into play. These three items will form the core of your program, selection, use, maintenance. Let's talk about the benefits. From a selection point of view, it's going to affect safety a great deal. And we're going to look at the proper type and amount. And the one item on that I really want to focus on, for example, is compatibility. We typically see a breakdown right here. Compatibility is what is that element going to do with the other elements we currently have. Historically, when organizations look at their ensemble and they're looking to make a new purchase, they look at an element point of view versus an ensemble point of view. For example, they look at the element but they don't look at what the helmet's going to do as it interfaces with the jacket or the FCPA or the hood. Likewise, they don't look at the jacket, the glove, or sometimes the jacket, the trousers. So these are some of the breakdowns that we see in the compatibility area. Proper use, training, drill, and issuing. Training and drilling is this. When we look at training the firefighter, we need to train them on their ensemble. We 
need to train in a practical sense that they understand how the ensemble is going to work, and again, they recognize when is it the ensemble going to fail. Given that firefighter information on TPP and THL is nice to know, but we have to put it in a context that they can actually use it in the field. Telling a firefighter the TPP of 42, and we explain to him that he can survive in a flashover environment for roughly 20 seconds with nothing worse than a second to be burned, they're going to be tempted to test it out. They're going to push it to that limit. So what I'd like to do is to take this science and put it into a practical sense, and that's where your training is going to come into play. Um, Jeff alludes to the DRD. Like the DRD or not like the DRD is irrelevant at this point in time. It's there. It needs to be trained. And as I talk to organizations about the traffic rescue device, that five or six seconds of silence that I sometimes get tells me that they do not even know that the DRD is in position, let alone how to use it. I've seen a lot of other things come to DRD. One of them, I heard the story where the organizations as members are taking a carabiner and a short leash and tying the firefighter off to a door or something so he has to drop the nozzle. They can pick the nozzle up and go with it. Okay. No. But what I also want to focus on with the DRD and training is this, do it in the practical sense of the word. If you notice closely the slide that Jeff had on here to show the firefighter using the DRD, you will notice that neither one of them have the SCBA face pieces on or the SCBA, which means that they were not blind. Put someone down, put a tank on them, and obscure the vision of the person going to rescue and put gloves on them, you'll change the dynamic of how that DRD is going to be deployed quickly. Health and safety. This is maintenance right here. This is typically maintenance. What we're going to do here is we're trying to minimize as best we can the buildup of soils, contaminants, blood, blood, blood and body fluids, etc., from becoming a health risk. This is where maintenance will kick into play. We're also looking at exposure control. The program will look at exposure control from three points of view. One, we're going to try and protect personnel and public. Personnel will be all members of the organization as we move about the facility. <coughs> Simply put, from OSHA's point of view, we are attempting to keep soil areas from clean areas where we can control them. It may not be a perfect world out there, and we may not be able to exercise that control all the time, <coughs> but most certainly we can do a better job than what we appear to be doing right now. The public, this is really an issue come October, Fire Prevention Week, although I see it all the time, but Fire Prevention Week, Fire service is historically guilty of putting public into PPE ensembles that are frontline use. They're also guilty of finding the dirtiest, the most battle-hardened ensemble they can find just to show that it looks cool. If we're going to use protective ensembles for the public, these should be dedicated for that purpose. They should be clean or at least be brand new or simulated where we get the effect and the look, but we're not exposing the public to soil contamination. We're also going to be looking at trying to protect our facilities, our stations, and also along with that, it's often overlooked, our apparatus crew caps. We go to the scene, we enter the event, and all too often I see us do what? We get back in the apparatus cap and we wear the PPE back home, and then we look at it for problems. Well, usually by the time we find out we've got a problem, we've already contaminated our cab. Or if we have not, let's look at the long-term buildup of soils and debris as they slough off into the apparatus cab create contamination has at some point in the long term. And looking at standards, NPA standards, OSHA standards, regardless, are all standards are going to play a role in your life. So as the slides before indicated, is that if we look at our program, we need to research the standards. As I was working with the US Air Force, it amazed me that when I questioned some of the people that they were appointed to the PP position, these individuals were not properly trained. And when I mentioned that the DODI, which is identified here as other standard, there's also more. And if you are Air Force in this room, then you know that you have the AFI, and then you have the TIG, and these individuals do not even know these documents existed. So as we get into looking at the administrative program part, that's where this fits. In the administrative section, as we start to drill down even deeper, Table of contents and reduction, and there we go, standards and regulations. We need to identify which ones are applicable to your unique situation, to your organization. 
Next, we get into selection. These are the five minimum, as I see it, program parts that go into selection that have to be dealt with. Number one is that risk assessment that you're hearing so much about. The risk assessment is a tool that gives you, requires you to step back for a moment and begin to defend why did you buy what you purchased? Why did I select that particular helmet? It's not going to ever eliminate all injuries or all fatalities, never. But it's going to give you cause to step back for a moment and maybe rethink why did you do what you do. From another point of view, it's going to show that you did apply some methodology to selection, especially if something went horribly wrong and you're being challenged. A lawyer, compliance officer, somebody may be taking you to task on why did you select that particular element or that ensemble, and your risk assessment will start laying the groundwork for it. Again, it doesn't mean it prevented it, but what it means is you did at least put some thought to it, is all we're saying here. The evaluation process is also critical. The evaluation process is going to be a tool by which you can determine what protective element or protective ensemble is going to meet the threat of your risk assessment. The certificate of hazard assessment, I broke it up separately, but it can be combined with the risk assessment. But this document is required by OSHA, if you're under their jurisdiction, to identify what specific element meets that risk assessment. So you're going to identify, for example, the manufacturer model number at this point in time. Again, if something goes wrong and you say, I identified this as meeting my risk assessment and validated through my evaluation, and you inadvertently have this, it's going to ask questions. It's going to bring a lot of issues to you. So please, look at those very carefully. Now, as I indicated, you can take the certificate of hazard assessment and combine that with risk assessment, but at some point, both of those requirements have to be stated. Once that is done, will be required to put together an element specification. So that as you go out and purchase the PPE, again, you're going to make an effort to purchase what you have just identified as meeting your threat. have to do this. And equally important, last item, is the acceptance inspection. As the equipment starts to arrive at your organization, somebody has to be in position to say, yes, it meets our risk assessment, it meets our spec, and we accept it for use. And once you accept it, goes on the floor, you are in essence saying it's safe to wear. It meets my organization's risk assessment. I do know of three instances where that failed to happen. In one instance, where there were hand injuries, burn injuries with a particular glove, this glove had actually failed in the evaluation process and was disqualified. But yet, it was purchased because it was low bid, got into the system, and actually got into the warehouse because no one did the acceptance inspection which would have rejected it. So all of these documents are going to come into play for selection, and Chief Foley will speak to them in more detail in his presentation. Training, I do not have a lot of time to go through this, but again, think that you want my PowerPoint, I put this information on here to help you, and that will make it available to you. Key word is we need to train our members on how to safely work and survive within their clothing system. I want to go straight to this slide and go to the last item, sounding the alarm. Firefighters need to realize there's no shame in sounding the alarm. It's no different than the bell on the SCBA indicating that you're about to have a problem. As firefighters get into duress, they're hesitant to do that because they're afraid of what their peers might think of them. They're buckling the peer pressure, and by the time the alarm is sounded, historically it's too late, and the firefighters injured even before they get outside. Company officers also play a role here, team leaders, crew chiefs, whatever your designation is, is that when a member of your organization is telling you they're in distress, please take it seriously and egress. You can always sort it out later to find out was the alarm valid or not valid, but to try and make that decision as the scene is going on is not correct. I know of three instances again where company officers looked at the alarm as a firefighter was just uncomfortable, he really wasn't getting hurt when in fact he was getting hurt, and there were a lot of conditions why. Uh, just because we all look alike on the fire ground does not mean our protective apparel is working the same way. There will be a lot of things changing the dynamics here. So simply put, as firefighters want you to do their part and sound the alarm at the right time, and company officers need to act on that alarm at the right time. We 
you get into part two and three, you're issuing exposure control. When we issue the PPE, the person is doing that needs to be trained to look out for things. Sizing is number one. Firefighters, honestly, don't always tell you what size they really wear. Okay? So somebody who is issuing a jacket or a trouser or a helmet is going to have to be looking for that. And what you're looking for is interface. Are the sleeves too short? Do we have separation between glove and jacket? Is the overlap between jacket and trouser an issue? Uh, there could be a number of factors that come into play. So just before you start handing off a protective ensemble to someone, the person that's going to issue needs to be trained. They're the front line of defense. Is the system actually going to work as a system <coughs> the ensemble now? We talked about exposure control already. Personnel safety. I identified this as a separate issue because now we are not talking to members per se. We are talking about the staff who are actually going to perform maintenance. They are going to be held to a higher threat level. The reason why is they are definitely working with protective ensembles that are going to be soiled or contaminated or suspected. And in OSHA's words, if you suspect, you shall assume. So with that in mind, they're going to have to increase their PPE. And in addition to the ensemble itself presenting a safety and health risk to the member performing the maintenance, there's also chemicals involved. They're going to be working with cleaning chemicals and they're going to be working with liquids which will present splash hazards to them. So when I get into personnel safety, what I'm looking at right here is specifically to the members of your organization who are uh, <coughs> we're performing the actual maintenance on the protective ensemble. We want to protect them. Special incident events. This is a use part of your program. It deals with protocols that you will follow in the event that we have a firefighter who is injured or we have a fatality. And anytime you suspect that PPE is <coughs> involved, there are certain procedures you need to enact to safeguard that PPE. I coach organizations I work with at this point in time, look at this as a crime scene and treat the PPE as evidence because it most certainly will be, be looked upon as that. Losing it or contaminating it uh, is going to present problems for you. So this will be part of your program. The last part is going to be the maintenance. The last core part is maintenance. There are several program parts here. Record keeping being one. NFP 1851 identifies all the required items that need to be tracked. And they're very important to do so. If something goes wrong, compliance authorities or somebody who's doing investigation historically is going to start looking backwards in time. They want the history of that protective ensemble. And when they ask for it and you have that five or six second delay, um, that's not going to be a good moment for you. So please uh, start looking at record keeping. You're going to be looking at cleaning protocols for these three levels of cleaning, uh, the inspections, the testing, repair, storage. Now in storage, I break it out into two groups. I'm looking at long-term and short-term storage, long-term being what is in your warehouse, what is on the shelf. And I actually start record-keeping there. The reason why is you accepted it, you're going to document that you accepted it, it has become part of your program at that point in time. Now, it can show as being an inventory, but here starts your great, great tracking right here. Short-term, this is equipment that is between shifts. The firefighter is off duty. It could be in a locker. It could be in any place. And most of these places are are not where they should be. <laughs> the back of cars, at home, uh, and I can think of any number of other places where protective ensembles are being stored that are very, very inappropriate. <laughs> as I begin to wrap this up, as I begin to wrap it up, I still agree with a lot of objections to the program. And one of it comes from, from these points of view is a selection, a uh, systems approach is not followed. A big one, no risk assessment, is purchased based on past history and traditions. Chief Foley will speak to that. Uh, I've even had people come, I purchased it because the sales rep is a friend of so-and-so who throws a very good barbecue. <laughs> Look, that may be the case, but if you're ever in front of a compliance officer, that's not the right answer they want to hear. So please avoid that one. Tradition over performance and looks over performance. If you are responsible for your organization's PPE, you can pretty much expect to be taken off the Christmas card list because you're going to be making decisions and doing things that may not be popular with a lot of members of your organization, especially where it doesn't look cool. And use. We need 
need to address our training, our attitudes. The attitude of the member has to be changed in some regards. And maintenance. This is a big one, and this is where I really come in to work. Typically, when I get a phone call from an organization asking for help, something <coughs> went wrong. I cannot think of a single instance where I have been called on the front side of a project. I usually call on it broke, and now we need help. And in the area of maintenance, it's oversimplification, number one. I have people tell me that, well, cleaning, it's not rocket science. And, and why is it so hard to throw a jacket in a washer? Okay, I will agree with you it's not rocket science, and we're not going to Mars. However, I will also tell you it is a science. Cleaning is a science. If you doubt me, start to look at commercial laundry facilities, such as Mission Laundry or others like that. They do a lot of work. They go into the detail of even measuring how hard the water is. Now, why that's important here is that we are dealing with soils. We are dealing with soil types and soil concentration they don't see. So we need to take what they know and also apply what we know to create a good cleaning program. It is by far more complicated than just buying a washer extractor from Lowe's or Home Depot. It has to be at the proper type and amount of equipment or your maintenance program will fail and somebody is going to get hurt. Attitudes. It took me a long time to get it dirty, and I like it this way. Followed by firefighters intentionally getting their equipment soiled or damaged. People putting helmets in barbecue pits, not making that one up. <laughs> Maintenance is resisted, especially the members. They want that battle hardened look. Again, you're not going to be popular if you pull a helmet from someone's hands that's all burned and crisped up like uh, Jeff has shown or Chief Bully is about to show you. They want those helmets, and I know of one instance where a helmet was condemned, and I know I'm belaboring this, and I appreciate your intelligence, but it's important, it was condemned. The firefighter begged to have it back so he could take it home and put it on the fireplace. Well, it begs the question, if it was loaded with soil, why is it going home? But aside from that, where the story is really going is this. He was given a new helmet, but guess which one he took home? The new one. Put that on the shelf, kept the old one in service. And how it came to happen is that there was a hand injury, which is totally irrelevant to the helmet. The firefighter who got hurt started to come under pressure, and to deflect that, he said, well, my captain's wearing a condemned helmet. <laughs> and the last slide I have is, these are some of the other obstacles that I've run into, and this is mostly from the organization, from management. Budgeting number one. We budget for the preventive maintenance, of our apparatus, our power rescue equipment, and a number of other equipment items. But to this day, a number of organizations, <coughs> the majority, tell me we do not have an adequate budget or any budget for our personal protective ensemble. I've seen organizations number in the thousands, and yet only have seventy-five to fifty hundred thousand dollars worth of money for maintenance, and that's woefully inadequate. But it tells me what they think of their PPE, and again, I work to try and change that attitude. And uh, as Chief Foley briefs you, he will uh, he will build on that. I thank you very much for your time. Sir, sir, sir. Thank you.
and, and, and you know, we have to purchase PPE for both. And in our wildland operation, we're different than the other uh, federal forest agencies because we consider that uh, aggressive initial attack on structural fires uh, to do to conduct uh, interior operations as a way to keep the, the fire out of the wildland environment also. So we have, we have a very defined structural role. And I want to make sure you understand that. Cal Fire currently has 4,700 career firefighters. We have another for our wildland mission, we bring on another 3,100 seasonal firefighters for the, the wildland role. And uh, we, have, we also administer in those local government contracts another 5,600 volunteer firefighters. The top, if you add them up, you know, we're purchasing right around you know, 13,000 sets of, of, of turnouts. You know, talk of your structural ensembles, as Carl will tell you it is, and NFPA, that's what we're into. So that's kind of where our perspective is. We have also, we, we use uh, inmates in our, uh, in our wildland crews for, for uh, camp crews. And we also have volunteers in prevention, and that is um, specifically public education for the most part. CAL FIRE is broken down into 21 administrative units. Within those units, we have both municipal and wildland responsibilities. Just so you know, we have 803 engines. So you get an idea of, of the comparison between our wildland and our state and our, and our municipal operations. The state, which represents the wildland, 228 engines. And then under contract, we, we, we cover 575 engines. That's our, our, we have 38 ladder trucks, rest of vehicles, and so on. Just want to make sure that we call out, kind of understood. Last night I had a dinner with uh, uh, Dan Melia. What's that? Million. I get that wrong, sorry. He's the safety chief for FDNY. He was kind of curious how I was going to tie Cal Fire into, into the, uh, the, this presentation, he had no idea that we had that much of a municipal operation. What I want to get started with is really important in this topic is you understand all the standards that Jeff was talking about, and then the, the program part that Carl was talking about is, well, how do I get my arms around that? How, how do I understand what that means for us? I remember the first time I went to one of Carl's two-day seminars on 1851, and, and let me take you back. Three years ago, I was asked to chair the first statewide PPE working group that basically all 21 different units had their own PPE methodologies. We'll just call them that, okay? Pretty interesting, some of them. But their methodologies were a little bit different. We had several PPE issues that we had to address on the state level. So I was asked by Sacramento executive staff, would you chair the first ever PPE statewide working group? I said, yeah, sure. I was working on a couple of projects, one in the fire shelter program, a couple through the National Wildfire Coordination Group. I said, how difficult could that be? And uh, what, what a huge mistake that was. Um, I remember I went to pick up the issue papers after we formed the PPE working group. They said, hey, you'll meet a couple of times a year. You know, big deal. 27 issue papers. And all of them were complex. We had some issues like um, statewide, depending if you're in Butte in the north, which is a contract for Cal Fire, or San Diego and Riverside in Southern <coughs> California, all converge on our academy just outside of Sacramento for our, our training, and specifically our, specifically our structure fire training. Our firefighters are going there with different gear, specifically different TPP and THL, we'll get into that. They have different levels of protection. We were having some firefighters getting burned and some not. And all of us in this room are alpha males <coughs> and females, and we understand that if I'm going in with Joel, I know Joel, if, if he's in there and, and I'm in the burn building, I'm gonna stay in as long as he'll, I'm not backing up. He may have a TPP, well, I'm not gonna get into your TPP, <laughs> but, uh, but he may have a TPP that's significantly higher than mine. I'm, I'm having issues with how my gear is protecting me, but he's not, but my ego is not going to let me back up. And that's the type of situation that we were having with our firefighters, and they were getting burned. So we had to reconfigure and start taking a look statewide about how we are doing that, what we're doing. What I'm going to talk to you about is a paradigm shift that we had to go through. A paradigm shift from our traditional purchasing methodologies to what's required by OSHA, for us, Cal OSHA, and then the national standards, specifically 1851. Raise your hand if you've been dealing with 1851 at all. 
Not a lot, folks? Okay. It's, it's a complex program. It's basically everything that Carl was talking about. So I talked about this paradigm shift. And basically the paradigm shift takes us from traditional purchasing methodologies to what's required by the law. So what's, what are traditional purchasing methodologies? How do we, how do we acquire our structure fire, or our structural ensembles? Our turn up here, our bucket here. A lot of us over, over history have just gone catalog shopping or internet, whatever it is, but we're just going to search through all the vendor sites and take a look at, at what we like, you know? Some of us will go and say, especially our admin chiefs, they're really big with this. Hey, you have X amount of dollars and you need X amount of turnouts, so go do your thing, okay? That doesn't work. OSHA doesn't care how much money you had when you, when you went to purchase those ensembles, the, re the law requires you to conduct a hazard risk assessment to determine your levels of protection. We'll get into that in a minute. We buy the vets, well, what does that mean? The bigger one is we purchase the such and such department specification. Um, my wife is, is, is from the Midwest, as am I, but we went to her hometown a couple of summers ago and I was hanging out with some of her, her high school <coughs> friends who were part of the volunteer fire department in the town that she grew up in. And, and I was talking with them. They had a really nice station, grant funded stuff, really nice gear. And I asked them, you know, well, what gear is that? And how did you come up with it? He said, he said one guy says, well, this is FDNY spec. You purchased this. This is, this is the morning cry, da 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 I said, really, how did you come up with that? He said, what do you mean, how did you come up with it? It's the FDNY spec. Well, you know, what's the process that you went through to get it? <coughs> there was no answer. Long pauses, kind of like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, I'm thinking about how did you determine your, your protection values? How did that mesh with you? How did you do, how did you balance TPP and THL? I'll get into that a little bit. But that's one of the traditional purchasing methodologies. We just grab onto someone's spec that we think is cool and roll with it. Next one, we purchase a safer spec, we tag down to such and such a contract. Well, we've always purchased such and such years, so we just continue to purchase that, never had a problem with it. And when I was a firefighter, it was good enough for me to hear a lot of that on how the chief officers I deal with. Influences in those traditional purchasing methodologies. I want, I want to cover that. Anybody in the wildlife community at all? Raise your hand if you're in the wildlife community. LCES is an acronym for us for Wildland Firefighter Safety. LCES stands for Lookouts, Communication, Escape Routes, and Safety Zones, something we're always considering when conducting wildland operations. In the PPE world, it stands for Look Cool Every Second. <laughs> because, man, half of our, uh, we're a main bunch, man. We're not only alpha in nature, but we're a main bunch. And we want to look cool, and if we're ever going to a fire, especially in multi-jurisdictions, you know, where, where you get mutual aid, we're all looking at what each other's wearing. We want to look cool. We're conducting, a, we're in the middle of conducting a wildland PPE project with the U.S. Army Combat Research Center out of Munich, Massachusetts, and we're going through and explaining, you know, some of this LCES concept to the engineers that are helping us build the garments and looking at different fabrics and whatnot. And what, and what we're explaining that we said, you know, we're trying to develop a, a dual compliant uniform pant that will work as a uniform, but also as a, as a wildland response pant. And I said, you know, we have a lot of vanity issues and we're talking, we're talking to them about that. And, and one of the things I mentioned was the spec for the wildland out of 1977. It's a little bit roomier or baggier pant, right? Our firefighters don't like it. You know why I don't like it? Because it doesn't make their butt look good. And that's actually been told to us. So we deal with a lot of that. The native engineer said, well, hey, that's CDI. I said, CDI, what's CDI? They said, well, we make all the Army combat uniforms and new ACUs and all that, and we have to factor in CDI for the military. I said, well, what's CDI? I said, well, it's chicks dig it. <laughs> so it's, it's all that kind of stuff that were wrapped up, along with tradition issues that Carl touched on, as far as how we're purchasing and looking at purchasing our, our PPE. We need to change because the law tells us that we have to change. Make no no mistake, the law tells you that you have to conduct <laughs> a hazard risk assessment to determine the levels of protection that you need. OSHA specifically says you have three options. First option, 
do the risk assessment, determine what the needs are, and protect your firefighters to the anticipated exposures. Second option is to put administrative controls in place where you won't allow them administratively to be exposed to those because you can't provide them the PPE. And the third one is mechanical controls like lockout tag up. Doesn't work for Cal doesn't work for the fire service in general. Okay? But that's what that's specifically what OSHA says. We're all about by that. I had an interesting conversation with Dan last night. We were talking about risk assessments. And he was talking about um, uh, EMS boots that FDMY does. Anybody from FDMY here? What what he was telling me was was this that they selected an EMS, you know, duty boot for their EMS section and, and, uh, and there was a problem. And the problem ended up into what we have as state or Cal OSHA and, and in New York, they have a different organization, but the organization basically did a, an investigation on the selection process for the EMS boots, determined that they didn't do a hazard risk assessment and then find it. What I'm telling you is this is happening in a lot of places. If you don't have a written hazard risk assessment because the law requires it to be in writing, then you're opening yourself up to a whole lot of issues in any instance where PPE is a causal or contributing factor to firefighter injury. So one of the things that I wrestled with after a nice presentation from Carl, two days of shock value where I wanted to stick my head back in the sand, um, was this. Um, I went to Cal Fire Legal Council in Sacramento and I said, hey, uh, California isn't an NFPA state. We don't have to follow this. Uh, can you give me a legal opinion? Here's what our attorney said. If you do not have a standard, a local standard, more restrictive or less restrictive, that is defendable and documented, you will be held to the national standard in a court of law where PPE is a causal contributing factor of firefighter injury. So if you think for a hot second, because you're not in an NFPA mandated state, I know Joel is in Texas, right? Isn't, aren't they mandated? No, Mars takes that to uh, <coughs> All right. So did he use to be them? No. I thought Texas was. I could be wrong there. But, but anyway, if you're in an NFPA mandated state, you have to do it. So regardless, we need to follow the national standards. We're going to be held to that. I went to a PPE symposium right after I, I took the chair of the, of, of the PPE working group. Anybody been to the PPE symposium in Charlotte? Excellent. If you have anything to do with selection of working in PPE at all, you need to get to that symposium. They have it every couple of years. It's incredible. The amount that you learn at that is, is it's needed. In the process of doing that, one of the presentations was by an attorney. And the attorney basically his presentation was pretty short. It was a couple of years ago. And what the attorney Jim said was this. If, if we go to court, he represents firefighters who've been burned or, or injured, I should say. If we go to court and you're sitting on the witness stand as a chief officer or in any role has anything to do with the selection of PPE, here are the kind of questions I'm gonna ask you. And if you can't answer them, I'm coming after your retirement. It's not safe. I'm coming after your kids' education funds. They're not safe. I'm coming after everything you own. And he basically started like this. First question, please provide me a copy of your written hazard risk assessment as required by OSHA. Crap. I don't have one. Our department doesn't have one. We have over 10,000 people in structure here. I don't have a risk assessment a written hazard risk assessment to provide. Anybody in here have one? Raise your hand if you do. About one, two, three. Joel does in Houston, but that's about the average across the United States. Because after this, I started going to, to different symposiums, meet, trying to meet different people, because you know I've been chopping and squirting for 20 some years. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. If someone's got a hazard risk assessment that's gonna work for me, I want to review it, tweak it, and just use that but I couldn't find one that would be usable for Cal Fire at the time. So we had to start from square one. Jim went on to say and said, you know, ask questions like this. What was your process in, ident in identifying the protection values of the gear that you wear? Can you answer that? Was it going to the barbecue? 
Was that the process? You know, then he went on and, and asked some very specific questions, but it was all related back to the selection process that he went through to determine that. And I couldn't answer anyway. Why well, bother feeling like a fool? Okay. If you get a chance to do that, it's a great opportunity to learn more about, about this process and products. So what we did was we started this risk assessment process. And what we first had to do was determine what our TPP and THL values are. So TPP, thermal protective performance, Jeff hit it hard. I'm not going to get into it. But from a, 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 a Cal Fire perspective or from a fire department's perspective, my question was, how do I determine what my TPP is? How do I do that? Don't we all do basically the same job? Should we all be in basically the same thing? Well, not necessarily, the way the risk assessment process goes. Because TPP, you're looking for your maximum exposure. Remember those, those boxes that Jeff had? You know, when are you going to hit that maximum exposure? Is our maximum exposure going to be flashover conditions? For us, that's what we determined it was going to be. And we know that to be above 1,000 degrees, 1,200, whatever it is. So then we had to start looking at the number of seconds of performance that was, that, that was going to give us. The NFPA minimum is 35. It gives you 17.5 seconds of protection. Remember, Jeff, time of protection in that maximum exposure. So we had to take a look at that. Look at our response times. Look at our building construction. Look at all the data that we have, injury data, uh, for, for burn injuries, everything. We had to take a look at all of these factors, our SOPs, our SOGs. How are we teaching people to fight fire? When they're in the training environment, what kind of exposures are they going through? How is their gear performing? What is it doing? What do we need to do? Those are all the factors that we had to take a look at. I thought I was hoping, I was praying to God it was only going to be a two or three page document. That would be about 40 by the time we got done to take a look at all of those factors. <laughs> Training standards, numbers of response, time of maximum exposure, all that. We know that THL has an inverse relationship with TPP, as THL is simply the garment's ability to, to, to get rid of the physiological heat that you build up. So let me ask you a question. I worked in the city of Coachella. Anybody know where Coachella is? That was one of my first assignments. Coachella is about 25 miles southwest of Palm Springs. I'll just tell you this, it's <coughs> Africa hot. Bad news, it's hot, okay? It, it sets, it's right on the Salton Sea. You, you're getting a little more familiar with where it's at. The TPP of the garments that we have are critically important. When you do your risk assessment, you need to consider how you're wearing that structured garment, what you're doing. For us, our department's SOPs on when we wear that garment, structured fires, obviously, what else? Extrication, vehicle fires, dumpster fires, any kind of refuse because you got to wear your SUV, we don't wear that over wildland, that we don't know what it is. So we take a look at all the different ways we wear that garment. So now, depending on what department you're in and how you're using that garment, the TPP and THL values may change a little bit. They have an inverse relationship. As TPP goes up, what happens to THL? goes down. You have to strike that balance. There's a range typically between the minimums established in NFPA that go way up from there for both TPP and THL. You have to go through all of those factors and determine what's the appropriate level for your department. It may or may not be the same as New York City. I don't know. That's your decision. Understand that process. So we took a look at some of these factors, and I'll just run you through a couple. We took a look at, at some of our heat injury data. Again, heat injury is directly correlated with THL against our burn data. How is that happening? Where are we injuring our people? This is going to give us an idea of how we need to balance TPP and THL. So we started looking at that and we realized we have a whole lot more heat injuries, and these are heat, these are not your average or everyday ordinary heat injuries. Because okay. we all know, we all see the firefighters broke off on the back of the engine, you know, sucking on O2 or, or, or covered in water and someone nursing them back to health, you know, and, and we've all been there. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the people who, who have been injured sufficiently enough that they had to go to the hospital and work comp claim was filed. So these numbers are skewed. But we have two to one heat injury to burns, and most of our burns, as we started taking a look at them, and we broke it off wildland and structural. But a lot of our burn injury was happening 
in the interface areas, head, neck, and face, hands and wrists, and we're going to get feet injuries too. So we had to take a look at that. That has to be part of your risk assessment. How are your firefighters becoming injured? You need to hone in on how that gear stick, your current gear is performing, so in the risk assessment process, you can determine how, that, how you move forward. Now, I've had several conversations with my brother Joel here from Houston. They have taken a look at their gear, correct me if I'm wrong, now, and, and, and beefed up the gear in certain areas where you were having problems. Part of the risk assessment. It needs to be done. Structure fire burn injuries, that animal's wildland. So in the process, what are you doing, really? What are you doing? You're going to define TPP and THL, but you can't stop there. You have to take a look at how your gear is performing. What are the issues that you have in your community? So let's take a look at it. Strength after thermal exposure. That's your maximum exposure. That's typically an outer shell issue because your outer shell protects your thermal barrier. Okay, that's its job. So you want to make sure that that material is going to protect the thermal line. And the moisture barrier. Tear strength. How's that outer shell and the thermal liner and moisture barrier uh, working as far as if you get a hook caught on something? How does it tear? You know, for us, we went to our independent service providers. We took a look at, at all of that data to find out how our gear was going out of service. And what we found was tears, tears were, were a big deal for us, but the tears fell within the repair parameters of NFP 1851 or the manufacturer. And that's what the law says. So, so we only went down and said, well, you know, that was a big deal for us, but abrasion was huge for us. That's next. So we started looking at the factors of the fabrics on how they perform with abrasion. It was part of the risk assessment, all defined in our risk assessment. UV performance, another big deal for us in California. And I noticed the same thing the other day when I was walking down the street in New York. How many of you, your fire engines, you come on duty and your gear goes on the engines and some of your gear goes in some pretty interesting places? I mean, I see the, some engines looking like gypsy wagons driving down the road with their jackets tied on, blowing in the breeze. For us, it's a lot of the wet gear, the wildland stuff, you know, flopping in the wind on the engine, wherever it's at. But in that situation, it's getting hammered by UV, which is one of the biggest contributing factors in the degradation of your ensemble. So we looked at that UV performance. What, how, how is this working out? Because we know it's really hard to change firefighter behavior. You know, it needs to go in a bag, it needs to be protected, but that's, that's a task in and of itself. Moisture management with ability, slickness of the face cloth for donning and doffing and comfort, moving inside the gear, spun lace versus needle punch. Put that in there, I want to hone in on that. Um, we went to a presentation the first day um, where a doctor out of uh, uh, Skidmore College was talking about how important weight is in the studies that they did on the physiology, specifically the VO2 output and the core body temperature of firefighters. That weight that they found, the weight is the most significant issue. So me, not the dragon dirt thrower, I'm thinking, it's got to be that SCPA. Those damn things need to get lighter. She said, no. She said, weight in the lower body has an eight times magnification, or whatever the doctor language was on that. So it's eight times more important than the gear in your upper body. So a pound of weight in your lower body, specifically down towards your feet, has much more impact than the, the weight you carry in your upper body. So you need to take a look at your gear then. How can you get the best bang for the buck when it comes to weight? There are some new technologies that are up there. Spun lace needle punch, I'll show you some of that. The other thing that you need to consider when you're doing your risk assessment is how your gear performs. Now this was just a, a bit, I'll brief, briefly on this accident. Firefighter, single, form, uh, single family, residential structure, six feet inside a doorway, the, the, the room contents flashed, they hit, so, they, so they hit that ME, the maximum exposure, and that happened time of the incident and the time they got in, the time it flashed, the time they backed up was somewhere in the five second area. So that's the gear damage at five seconds. Not a huge issue, but what we were doing at the time was we were trying to take a look at how Nomex was comparing 
or <laughs> in comparison to some of the more advanced products, you know, the Nomex Kevlar blends, the PBIs, the PBOs, those things. And what we notice here is that that is a Nomex goggle cover. It broke open with about well, five seconds of exposure. The firefighter happened to be wearing a uh, Nomex Kevlar blend in the, in the jacket. The only real damage as far as break open was, was that the reflective tape, not a huge issue. But what we did was we started tearing it apart. Now I know more about fabrics and fibers than I ever cared to know. Started learning four years ago. Believe me, someone needs to be a PPE geek in your organization. It happens to be me and a couple other folks. But we started looking at how that performed. We saw dye sublimation in both the outer shell and in the moisture barrier. Anybody know what dye sublimation means? One of the things I learned over the last few years, dye sublimation is the temperature at, at which the dye will burn out of the fabric, typically about 700 degrees. So we knew that it exceeded that because the dye burned out of both the outer shell and into the moisture barrier, which has a pajama check Nomex. So these are the things, these are just examples of what you need to be looking at about how your gear performs. Your injury data, how this performs here, take a look at that. Your risk assessment is a living document. It will change. There's no right or wrong. It's what's best for you. Again, abrasion. The reason I put this slide up there, abrasion is a huge deal for us. It may not be for you, but abrasion, there's no NFPA test for it. This taper test is not an NFPA test. You need to dig deep after you examine your gear, how it's performing. Outline any risk assessment. Take a look at the testing methodologies. Jeff covered a lot of them. Those were NFPA for the most part, but there's other testing methodologies out there to take a look at where the strengths and weaknesses are on your current gear. Thermal barriers, I'm just going to breeze through this. I talked to you about needle punch, that's pretty much old technology. It's, a, it's that, remember Jeff talked about the thickness of the garment? That's how it was originally measured in NFPA. Needle punch battings for thermal barriers are pretty thick. They provide great TPP. The spun lace battings now, now they have all sorts of different stuff, new technologies out there. They have three dimensional spun lace battings that, that add air gap in there that give you a pretty good um, uh, weight of protection value, if you will. So it will reduce the weight, give you a really good protection value. It, I, I'm getting a whole lot of like confused looks like, like, I didn't know that type thing. These are all the things that you need to know in understanding your uh, your risk assessment. So I want to, as I breeze through this, I want to leave you with a couple of things. What's really important, I'm going to take you to what President Clinton said. We all heard him speak, right? Everybody's in there for a president. One of the things he said was this, and it was really important to me. He said, sometimes when you ask the right question, you'll get the wrong answer. Remember that part? And then he said, but if you don't ask the right question, you'll never, if you ask the wrong question, you'll never get the right answer. I wrote that down, I'm trying to commit to memory, screwed up already, but, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the concept is, is that <laughs> what questions are you asking, it's all part of your risk assessment. We're all very, very similar, but we have differences. And you need to examine what those are, outline them in your risk assessment, and then your risk assessment, like Carl said, needs to tie into your spec. We go on, take a look at different things here. If my time's up, it's time for us to leave. I talk more about those slides, don't have time. But, but that's where we're at. Uh, I'm pretty much done, Jeff Carlini. We do have maybe time for a couple of questions. If uh, you want to, I know it's, it's lunchtime here and the session's officially over, but uh, uh, thank you for your attention. But any, any questions of any of the presenters today, please uh, come here. Yes, uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation, and I thank thank you for it. The one thing that I would like to ask uh, Jeff is, in regards to 1971 and the NFPA standard, uh, we've done a tremendous job at in, of uh, increasing our uh, level of protection for firefighting in regards to the fires, etc. But there's one element that fire protective clothing really uh, has very uh, uh, severe limitations, 
and that's protecting us from carcinogens such as benzene and such. And that's one of the things, when you started Project Heroes, that's what I saw the value in that project. And I was wondering, uh, we want to get more involved in the process. We want the gear to be uh, more sensitive to the needs of what's really killing firefighters out there. And, that's, and one of those things being occupational cancer. Well, you mean the, the, the senior end option of Project Heroes, that part no. did go into the stand, but it was not as an option. But one of the nice things that they did <coughs> was they agreed that like addressing interfaces yeah. could be done. And yeah. they, did, they did want, I mean, right now there are certain design, as I told you, sometimes standards can be limiting. Right. In fact, there are limitations that prevent good interfaces sometimes. We tried to remove those in the last edition of standards now. Actually, I proposed something to address your issue, but yeah. shot down by the committee. I don't think they're ready for it because it, it's, the industry is not really willing to go to systems testing. When I say systems, the entire ensemble. Thank you. Other questions? No. I'd like to comment on his question. I, I think research that's ongoing now in the next couple of years is going to show that gases, vapors, ultrafine particles, and a lot of other combustive byproducts may be going right through these three layer composites. And it's not just the interfaces, it's the basic inherent material. And that eventually, I think the committee's going to have to figure out, once that's validated, how to design products that are going to protect you. The drawback is going to be they're going to be tougher against uh, heat stress, they're going to be right. buckling you into that thing. So yeah, that's some ongoing work right now in Australia looking at uh, contaminant levels on skin and working uh, training fires and so on. And, and then they're showing just that, the carcinogens that are on the skin. Now, of course, the cause link between that is exposure and you know, any kind of disease or cancer. And that's Tools are in place uh, to do that in our barrier materials, it will work, but there are significant trade-offs. Other comments or questions from anybody? Well, thank you very, very much for your participation today. Oh, any of those?